um, these are some notes uh, taken from the Bible study on the 22nd uh, of February, and it's about the greatest sin, the greatest sin. Um, there's also a link to some Bible verses that you should read uh, before listening to this. So what makes uh, one crime greater than another crime? Or what makes the same crime worse? Why do we take genocide more seriously than somebody skipping on the metro? Or why does one murder get one sentence and another murder get another sentence? Well, today we're going to look at the system that God uses to rank some sins as worse than others. For in chapter 12, Jesus describes a crime, a sin that God deems in unforgivable. A sin for which the sentence is eternal. This sin, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, this sin is described as the greatest sin. And because it's hard to ex understand exactly what this sin is, and because the condemnation of this sin is so severe, these verses often generate a lot of confusion and a lot of anxiety. But if we understand what this specific sin is, a sin which a Christian cannot commit, but if we understand what it is, it will help us better understand why God judges some sins as, as worse than others. So let's start where Jesus ends in those verses that you just read. Jesus ends by saying the final condition of that person is worse than the first. Jesus let, left one of the people he met in a better condition than when he first met him. They brought to Jesus a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute, and Jesus healed him so that he could both talk and see. So, this man had a demon, and this demon made him both blind and mute. But when this man left Jesus, he left demon free, no longer blind but able to see, and no longer mute but able to speak. That man left that scene in a better condition than at the start. However, the Pharisees, who often heard what Jesus said and saw what Jesus did. These Pharisees left their encounter with Jesus in a worse condition. And Jesus gave an a parabolic to explain why the Pharisees were in a worse condition after they met Jesus than when they met him at first. Jesus tells a parable in which he wants us to picture a man who has a demon in him. But this demon is removed. And so that man should be the home for it, 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 the man is a home for something good, something else, something positive. But the demon returns with even more demons. And the last condition of that person is worse than the first. Now, the Pharisees, they weren't filled with demons. They were filled with unbelief. The Pharisees were filled with unbelief. But Jesus removed the grounds for their unbelief by performing signs and performing miracles. The things Jesus did should have removed the unbelief of the, sus of the Pharisees. They should have left Jesus in a better condition. But after Jesus removed the grounds for unbelief, making home for them to believe in Jesus, the Pharisees remained unbelieving. In fact, they were filled with even greater unbelief. And so the final condition of the Pharisees was worse than the first. The blind man left Jesus seeing, but the Pharisees left Jesus more blind. For though they could see and understand what Jesus did, they close their eyes to the truth. We read of this 
that Jesus, even after Jesus had performed so many signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. As Jesus said in Matthew 13, this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes. You can see another example of that in John chapter 9, if you want to give that a read. But we also see it in these verses we just read from. In verses 13 and 14, Jesus heals a shriveled man's hand. Now the Pharisees should have at least seen Jesus do this and concluded that Jesus was a good man. But what did they decide to do? They decide they plotted to put Jesus to death. And so the Pharisees left in a worse condition, for instead of seeing Jesus as a good man, they saw him as an even more evil man. Again in verses 22 to 24. Verses 22 to 24. We see that Jesus healed the, the, the man of the demon. And all the people were astonished and said, could this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, it's only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, this fellow drives out demons. You know, the Pharisees should have at least seen Jesus as some kind of prophet, some kind of good person sent by God. But instead of seeing that, they were filled. Um, they, they, They said that what Jesus had done was by the hand of Satan. They should have seen what Jesus did as positively good, but they made out that Jesus was positively evil. In all of these situations, the final condition of that person was worse than the first. So that was the that was what Jesus last said in those verses I gave you. But the first thing Jesus said was, "Whoever has ears, let them hear." Now, from a scientific point of view, hearing is the most passive of senses. The other senses, touch, taste, smell, sight. They're all active in rejecting stuff that they don't like. If your eyes don't like what they see, you close your eyelids. If your tongue doesn't like what it tastes, it spits it out. If your skin doesn't like what you touch, your skin, you'll, you'll recoil because of some extreme temperature or pain. And if your nose doesn't like what it smells, well, <laughs> you'll probably hold your nose or something similar. All of these senses are two-way traffic. We receive something and then they reject something. But our ears, they don't have the same ability to reject stuff. Scientifically, hearing is passive. We just hear, we can't reject it. But though the the science would describe hearing as passive, Jesus said that it was not. Jesus said that our hearts reject, recoil, refute anything that we hear that we don't wish to accept or believe. That's why we don't hear in the sense of letting in everything that we hear. As we read in John, then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, teacher, we want to see a sign from you. Sorry, separate. Uh, Yeah, uh, basically, Our ears don't necessarily accept when we hear something. Our our hearts can reject it, refute it, refuse to listen, even if we know that it is true. Notice how Jesus responds to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law when they ask for a sign. Then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. He, Jesus, answered, A wicked and adulterous generation ask for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Jesus refused this request for another sign. In fact, he described the request as wicked and adulterous. That's pretty strong language to use. Why did Jesus describe the request for a sign as wicked 
an adulteress. Well, an adulterous person claims to be committed to somebody on paper, but they're actually committed to somebody else. On paper, they are devoted to their wife, but in reality, they are devoted to their mistress. Now, the Pharisees, they claimed to be committed to three things. On paper, the Pharisees were committed to scripture. They believed the Old Testament scriptures were true. The Pharisees claimed to be committed to signs. You know, if Jesus proved his identity via signs, they'd believe. And the Pharisees claimed to believe, to be committed to scientific reasoning. You know, scientific reasoning, science goes where the evidence leads. The Pharisees claimed to com be committed to scientific reasoning, signs and scripture. But... When the Pharisees, sorry, but when the scriptures and when the signs pointed to the truth, the truth that Jesus was the Christ, the Pharisees didn't follow where the evidence led. They clearly claimed on paper to be committed to signs, scripture and scientific reasoning. But the reality was they were committed to what they already believed and what, the, or what they didn't want to believe. We read in John's Gospel, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. You know, they were committed to scripture only as long as it told them what they wanted, only as long as the scripture confirmed what they already believed. That's the real test of how Bible-believing I am and you are. How do we react when the, what the Bible says conflicts with our pre-existing opinions? How do we react when the Bible says something that conflicts with our desires? Again, verse John chapter 12, verse 27, it, we read that even after Jesus had performed so many signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. You know, we might subconsciously accuse God of being stubborn. If only I had more evidence, I'd believe this. If only I had more evidence, I'd have more faith. Now, that might be true sometimes. But we might accuse God of being stubborn when we're actually stubbornly not believing the evidence that God has already given. For example, Jesus had done so many signs in the Pharisees' presence. And the Pharisees might have gone, but the Pharisees were going, go on, Jesus, give us another. But Jesus wouldn't, because they were stubbornly not believing the evidence that God, Jesus had already given them. Now, you, we've not yet touched, touched on what blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is. But the context of Jesus' words helps us set the scene. You know, Jesus was stood among people who were denying the truth. And within, these, within the teaching surrounding these events, Jesus sets a principle. That God holds those who've received greater revelation more accountable. We think, see these things, that this, we, we live by this principle daily without realising it. If a child who's had a bad upbringing and lives in a, has had a, in a bad, bad area. And if they do something wrong, we say something like, oh, they didn't know any better. Whereas if a child who's had, had a good upbringing has been taught right and wrong, if they do the same thing, we might say, you should have known better. Those who ho have received greater revelation of what is true, what is good and what is right. Those who have received greater revelation are held more accountable. We see that principle at work in Matthew 11, chapter, verses 20 to 24. You might want to pause and read them now. But Jesus describes cities that had received greater revelation. They had seen the miracles that Jesus had done. And because they had greater revelation, Jesus holds them more accountable. Whereas those who received, and those who received greater revelation, 
and yet reject that revelation, are deemed more guilty and receive greater condemnation from those who have received less. Again, Jesus in verses 39 to 42 of chapter 12 sets, describes this principle again. He describes um, how, well, I'll read it for you. I'll just get it up on my screen. Uh, chapter 12, uh, Jesus said, Then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to Jesus, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. Jesus answered, A wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of your huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now something greater than Jonah is here. So Jonah had, wit had gone and witnessed to the Ninevites, and Jesus had gone and witnessed to the Pharisees. Who was the greater prophet, Jonah or Jesus? Jesus was the greater prophet. Now, who had seen greater, a greater amount of miracles? The people of Nineveh or the Pharisees? The Pharisees, the Pharisees had seen miracle after miracle, whereas Jonah performed no miracles and he only said a single sentence when he reached, uh, he only preached a single sentence when he entered Nineveh. Jesus was the greater prophet who had shown, done more, greater number of miracles and had spoken a greater number of words where Jonah was a lesser prophet who had spoke a lot less and had done zero miracles. And yet, how did the people of Nineveh respond to Jonah? They repented at the preaching of Jonah. And yet, how did the people of, how did the Pharisees respond to the greater prophet who did greater number of miracles and spoke greater number of words? The Pharisees did not repent. They'd received greater revelation, and because they ignored that re re revelation, God hold it, would hold them to a greater account. Those who receive greater revelation are deemed more guilty when they reject that revelation. And that's the context for Jesus' words. And so I tell you, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven. But blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. What is 2 plus 2? If you give me the answer of 4, and I say to you, you are an idiot. That means one thing. But if you tell me 2 plus 2 equals 4, and I respond to you, 2 plus 2 is monkey, that's a different uh, thing. In the first example, I am saying something against you. I am saying that you are an idiot. In the second example, I am saying something against what you've revealed. You've revealed to me that 2 plus 2 equals 4, whereas I'm rejecting it by saying 2 plus 2 equals monkey. I think, I think that blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is the same. Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is less about saying something against the Holy Spirit, such as curse the Holy Spirit. Instead, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is more about rejecting what the Holy Spirit has revealed. If, you, if I reject the fact that 2 plus 2 equals 4, I'm not rejecting you, I'm rejecting what you have revealed to me. Now throughout scripture the Holy Spirit is the member of the Trinity involved in revelation, revealing truth. And Jesus described the Holy Spirit as having a key role in revealing the truth about his identity. Jesus said when he, the Holy Spirit, comes he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. So in the scene that we read in Matthew 11 and 12, 
in this scene, the Holy Spirit had clearly revealed, had clearly demonstrated that Jesus was the Christ. But the Pharisees had rejected that revelation. Then they brought him a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute, and Jesus healed him, so that he could both talk and see. All the people were astonished and said, could this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard this, they said it is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. In, a, in this instance, the Pharisees were not just sinning against scripture. They were not just sinning against the signs. They were not just see, sinning against scientific reasoning. You know, there was something unseen going on in their heart where by the Holy Spirit was convicting them beyond doubt that Jesus was who he said. The Holy Spirit was clearly revealing to them that Jesus was who he said. And yet in response to the Holy Spirit's revelation was even greater unbelief, a refusal to believe, an increased denial, opposition to the, to the idea of Jesus being the Christ. They were opposed the idea in the strongest possible way. Now we should note the broadness of this verse before the invigable sin is even mentioned. And so I tell you, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven. You know, Jesus has the authority to forgive every sin imaginable. What a reassurance to those who worry about their salvation or were plagued with guilt. Jesus says, and so I tell you, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven. But if somebody rejects Jesus after the greatest revelation possible, the revelation of the Holy Spirit himself, if someone rejects Jesus, then they have put themselves beyond forgiveness. You know, the medicine cannot cure the person who rejects it. And Jesus cannot offer forgiveness to a person who rejects him. Even, especially if they reject him, despite the Holy Spirit doing everything on this, of everything possible to convince them not to. If you want to uh, do some further reading on this uh, subject, it would be there's some chapters that I uh, put in. Uh, there's some verses I reference uh, below this video. In fact, I've copied them, pasted them below this video that you can look at. And it outlines some of these principles that greater sin, sorry, that greater revelation means people are more accountable. Uh, yeah, so you can do study them in your own time.